Hello, and thank you for joining today's webinar on results from a recent phone survey conducted to assess the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on households in the impact evaluation sample for the strengthening PSMP4 institutions and resilience in Ethiopia. My name is Lucy Billings. I'll be moderating the webinar. Feel free to submit your questions at any point in the side panel on the right that says questions box and I'll read your questions during our Q&A session after the presentations. Please note that this webinar is being recorded um, and will be posted on the IFPRI website following the, um, following the presentations. To begin, I'm pleased to introduce Michael Mulford, Chief of Party at World Vision International, to give opening remarks, um, then Dan Gilligan, Deputy Division Director for the Poverty Health and Nutrition Division at IFPRI, will give an overview of the study. Following this, we'll have three presenters from IFPRI's Poverty Health and Nutrition Division, um, followed by the Q&A session. So with that, Michael, the floor is yours. Thanks, Lucy. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to keep my remor remarks very short. Um, I'll just uh, briefly begin by introducing SPEAR. For those who are not familiar, it's a five-year development food security activity funded by USAID's Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance. And we're implementing this, uh, supporting the government's Productive Safety Net Program in 15 waradas in Amhara and Oromia. And at the onset of COVID-19 in, in Ethiopia, uh, SPEAR, we pivoted uh, to um, kind of temporarily uh, pause some of our routine implementation and pivoted to supporting the government in promoting key messages, public health messages around COVID-19, um, also um, uh, yeah, safe social distancing, uh, health and hygiene, um, promoting hand washing, supporting hand washing stations. Um, yeah, other things we did, we supported the frontline health workers with some psychosocial support and uh, helping them manage their own stress and anxiety as, as a result of the, the pandemic, as well as being there to um, uh, being more equipped to support others that were experiencing heightened uh, stress and anxiety during this pandemic. So there's some other things that we did, but maybe I'll save more detailed description if that comes up in the Q&A. But for the purposes of this webinar, um, yeah, we, we wanted to uh, really understand the impact of COVID-19 on the lives and livelihoods of PSNP households in our areas. And we had some communication with the with with our staff that uh, were were um, in the communities however there were travel restrictions restrictions on group meetings and other things that led us to really want to know better kind of what was happening in our operational areas what was the uh, impact on the clients we were serving and as well um, yeah what were some of the ways people were coping with the challenges around COVID-19. So we discussed this with our learning partner IFPRI and with USAID uh, and you know, talked about what types of coordination we'd like to do with other people that we're thinking as well along the same lines of a phone survey. And that's when we yeah, kind of went into the planning uh, and design of the, of the survey, which I won't say anything about. I'll just turn right over to Dan to uh, lead us in that. But again, thanks to everyone who's joining and welcome. Hi, Michael. Thanks a lot. Uh, that was a great introduction um, to get us here. Um, so I'm just going to take a few minutes to just kind of uh, describe a little bit more detail the context and, and then give just an introduction to this phone survey as part of our broader impact evaluation study. Um, so by way of context, the, um, the first case of COVID-19 in Ethiopia was reported on March 13th. Um, it was just a few short days later that schools were closed, and by the end of March, the government had restricted travel. Um, use of public transit was also severely restricted, and they took other measures to slow the spread of the of coronavirus. L large gatherings were discouraged, and uh, people were generally advised to stay home. Um, by April, uh, a state of emergency had been declared, so um, there was a really uh, widespread and, and robust response. Um, as we might expect, that has some effects on people's earnings, and we're going to see some of that in, in the coming slides. Um, 
by end of June, the country had about 5,600, almost 5,700 confirmed COVID-19 cases and 98 associated deaths, um, but those case counts are, are now climbing. So as Michael described, um, in partnership with World Vision and their partners, um, we, we went ahead and worked with the, the impact evaluation sample that we're using for, we have an experimental evaluation that we began a couple of years ago, um, and that had a midline survey sample uh, that we collected data on in 2019. So we used those data to design and conduct a phone survey about the challenges facing this population in a pandemic. And so um, we covered the following topics. So the coronavirus, the coronavirus awareness, protective measures taken, and coping strategies. Um, we got some information about changes in livelihoods and food security assistance received and also experience with the uh, desert locust, which is a growing pest risk in the area. Next slide. So I'm just going to give a, a bit of an overview about the phone survey sample itself. So as I mentioned, the respondents are beneficiaries of, uh, all of them are beneficiaries of the fourth phase of the Productive Safety Net program. <clears throat> so they're all food and cash transfer beneficiaries, um, which makes them among the poorest people in Ethiopia. And they're part of this USAID-funded um, program, SPEAR, Strengthening PSN P4 Institutions and Resilience, um, implemented by our partners by World Vision, CARE, and ORDA. And as Michael mentioned, we're working in Amhara and Oromia regions. The respondents for this survey were all adult males. We, in the midline, we interviewed both, both males and females. Um, but we focused on adult males here in part um, to capture uh, income and other sources of information that we thought they might be better able to respond to. Um, so these were adult males from the sample households from our evaluation study, drawing from the midline 2019 midline survey. Only 35% of households in the survey have a phone or, or provide us with a phone number. Um, so that's less than a, no a number of neighboring countries. It also means that that sample is probably a little bit different and we uh, than the sample overall, we looked at that, and indeed they are, these households are slightly better off than the overall sample from our midline. And the phone survey was conducted from uh, June 1st to 14th by our survey partners, Laterate. Uh, we had, so with the 35% of the sample, the overall sample available to us, that was a target sample then of 1,328 households. Um, our enumerators were able to reach almost 1,200 households out of that target sample, which means we had a response rate of just under 90%, um, which is uh, really remarkable, actually, for a first-time phone survey in the sample. Okay, so with that, I'm going to pause and pass it on to uh, my colleagues to give you an overview of what we found, and I'll first turn it back to Lucy Billings. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks very much, Michael and Dan, for your introduction and the overview of the study. Our first presenter is Melissa Hydrobo, who will present on coronavirus awareness, responses, and self-reported effects. Over to you, Melissa. Thank you, Lucy. Um, I will be presenting, as Lucy mentioned, uh, about the coronavirus awareness, their responses, and their self-reported, household self-reported effects of coronavirus. Next slide, please. Virtually all households um, that we surveyed were aware of coronavirus, and the source for finding out about coronavirus was mainly through radio, with over 60% of our respondents um, mentioning radio as, the, as a source of finding out about coronavirus, followed by friends and neighbors, health extension workers, and health officials. Next slide, please. We asked households about protective measures that they used in the past seven days, and over 90% of households or respondents replied that they had washed their hands with soap for 20 seconds, avoided shaking hands or kissing on cheeks, kept at least two steps away from others, and avoided touching their faces. Um, 80% and uh, over 70% also mentioned avoiding large gatherings and avoiding public transportation. So most of our households were using protective measures. 
um, to prevent getting infected with coronavirus. Next slide, please. There were a few differences across regions and protective measures. Um, in general, almost 100% of our respondents in Oromia reported um, using protective measures in terms of washing their hands, avoiding shaking hands, keeping at least two steps away from others, avoiding large gatherings, and avoiding touching their faces. Um, the biggest difference between Oromia and Amhara is avoiding large gatherings and long queues, while almost 100% of respondents in Oromia were avoiding large gatherings. Um, only 70% reported avoiding large gatherings in, in Amhara. Next slide, please. We then asked our respondents um, what they believed their um, perceived level of risk was for corona infection. And 50% of respondents reported that they believed that their risk was high for coronavirus infection. Only 15 um, reported perceiving that they had no risk of getting infected with coronavirus. Next slide, please. Again, there are differences across regions. Um, the perception of getting infected with coronavirus is higher in Oromia. Um, so about 70% of respondents in Oromia reported that they believed that their risk of infection was high um, versus only 30% reporting that they believed their risk of infection was high in Amhara. Next slide, please. We then asked respondents about which aspects of coronavirus um, had had an impact on the household. And here, for each of these nine different aspects, um, we asked whether or not they had impacted um, the respondents' lives. And so you can see that school closures was reported by over 90% of households or respondents as having impacted their, their household. Um, the next most frequent aspects that were reported were unemployment or loss of income, um, fear of getting sick, so being sick or fear of getting sick, social distancing was also reported, travel restrictions, and about 70% of our respondents also reported food shortages as having an impact on their households. Next slide, please. When we look at these aspects across regions, um, you see that respondents in Oromia are reporting a larger number of negative effects than in Amhara, um, especially with respect to food shortages. Around 90% of households in Oromia are reporting food shortages, while about a little over 50% are reporting it in Amhara. Another big difference between the two regions is the church or mosque being closed. Um, this was reported by almost 100% of the sample. In Oromia, while it was only reported about 15% of the sample or respondents in Amhara. Next slide, please. Now, for those aspects um, where respondents mentioned, the aspects that respondents mentioned as having affected their, their household, we asked which one had the largest negative impact. So which aspect of coronavirus had the greatest impact on your household? Um, and again, regional differences come out quite strongly here with um, travel restrictions being the one most reported in Amhara while food shortages was the most reported in Oromia. So over 30% of households reported that food, in, over 30% of households in Oromia reported that food shortages had the greatest negative impact on their household versus about 15% of households in um, Amhara. Next slide, please. So to sum up, Virtually all households were aware of coronavirus, with radio being the most prevalent source of information about coronavirus. Most households report widespread use of protective measures, including hand washing, social distancing, avoiding large gatherings, and less so wearing masks or using hand sanitizer.
half of all respondents perceive the risk of coronavirus infection is high, while nearly 15% of respondents perceive that they have no risk of becoming infected. And the largest negative reported impacts of coronavirus are travel restrictions in Amhara and food shortages and income lost um, in Oromia. With that, I will pass it on to the next, to back to Lucy to introduce the next presenter. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And before I introduce the next speaker, I'd like to remind everyone to please submit your questions in the question box to the right hand in the right hand panel. And next we have Jessica Light presenting on changes in livelihoods and food security. Over to you, Jessica. Thank you, Lucy. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'll be presenting evidence about changes in livelihoods and food security. Next slide, please. We began our module about livelihoods impacts by asking households a simple question about shifts in their income over a recent reference period linked to the beginning of Lent. It's February 24th as a ceiling and date that households would have been aware of prior to the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. We can see that around 80% of households report that they've experienced a decrease in income in this period with a small number reporting a total 100% loss. So clearly income declines have been significant even over the first month of the pandemic. Next slide, please. When we break this down by source, uh, between 70 and 80% of households report declines in income from family farming or livestock raising and a non-farm family business. So this is clearly the overwhelming majority of households. And around 40% of households also report declines from wage employment or remittances from family working away from home. And these patterns are relatively consistent across the two regions. Next slide, please. We then asked households to identify up to three coping mechanisms that they're using to address the experienced loss of income. This slide shows the five most prevalent coping mechanisms reported. The most common is sale of assets. So around 40% of households report that they have sold assets in order to address an emergency loss of income. This is followed by receiving assistance from a non-governmental organization, reducing food consumption, and around 20% of households report that they have identified and engaged in additional activities to generate income or have relied on savings. And again, there was no notable difference in these patterns comparing across the two regions. Next slide, please. We focused in on one particular type of assets that is very salient for these households, livestock, and asked specific questions about sales of livestock over the same reference period. So about 45% of households do report that the number of owned livestock have decreased. However, about half of these households report the animal was sold for normal income needs, and only about 25% report that it was sold for emergency income needs presumably in a context in which it would not have been sold otherwise. So there is not yet much evidence of dramatic decrease in livestock stocks driven by the COVID emergency. Next slide, please. Consistent with the reported decline in income and the use of unusual coping mechanisms, we see that self-reported stress is extremely high among respondents. So respondents are asked to rate their stress on a scale from one to 10. Overall, about 60% of respondents uh, identify at the highest maximum stress level of 10. And there's also a pronounced regional difference that's evident here. So nearly 90% of respondents in Aromia report maximum stress relative to about 40% in Amharic. Next slide, please. Moving on to some questions about food security. We asked households to identify over what period of time they would be able to meet food needs for their household given current resources. So about 20% of households state that they could only meet a single week's food needs from current resources with about 30% stating that they could meet between two and four weeks needs and slightly under 30% stating that they could meet more than a month of food needs given their current available resources. Next slide, please. This 
pattern does, however, show a pronounced variation by region, consistent with some of the points that were made earlier by Melissa about the different effects reported in aromia. So we see that food vulnerability is reported to be much higher in aromia, with more than 30% of households there stating that they cannot even meet a single week's food needs given current resources, and Amhara, that's only 10%. Next slide, please. In this slide, we categorize households based on their category of food insecurity using the food insecurity experience scale developed by the FAO. So again, we observe that severe food insecurity is much higher in Amumia than in Amhara. So mild food insecurity, about 40% of households in Amhara report only mild food insecurity challenges. That's very low in Amumia, less than 10%. Whereas nearly 40% in aromia are moderately food insecure and 50% are severely insecure. By contrast, in Amhara, only about 30% are moderately food insecure and about 12% are severely food insecure. So again, we see a pronounced regional difference. Next slide, please. We also posed a series of targeted questions about decreases in children's egg and dairy consumption the consumption of more expensive, high-protein foods, again, using as the reference period a pre-COVID date linked to Lent. And here we see a substantial majority of households report decreases in consumption of both eggs and fresh dairy by children. So around 70% of households report that this consumption has decreased over this period, with about 20% reporting that it's been roughly constant. Next slide, please. We also analyzed some variation in food insecurity based on hotspot classifications. So the federal government in Ethiopia under the leadership of agencies that manage humanitarian emergencies characterize regions as emergency acute or moderate hotspots with respect to food insecurity. This is a time varying classification, and here we're using the classification from January 2020, that is prior to the onset of the COVID pandemic. Unsurprisingly, we see the prevalence of severe food insecurity is highest in the priority one emergency hotspots, but much higher still in Aromia. So in priority one hotspots, about half of households in Aromia are severely food insecure, while about 20% are in Amhara. In acute and moderate hotspots, the prevalence is accordingly lower. It's also interesting to note, returning to the question that Melissa alluded to earlier about what the greatest impact of COVID-19 is, in emergency hotspots, food shortages are identified as the most substantial impact of the COVID pandemic, with 33% identifying food shortages as a priority, followed by loss of income and travel restrictions. By contrast, in the acute and moderate hotspots, food shortages are not the most priority identified impact. By contrast, travel restrictions are identified as more important. Next slide, please. So just to summarize our findings around livelihoods and food security, we find that the overwhelming majority of our respondents do report that they've experienced a decrease in income over roughly the first three months of the pandemic. And in order to confront this decrease in income, they primarily draw on coping mechanisms, including the sale of assets, the receipt of aid, and the reduction of consumption. Households also report a high level of stress, again, particularly in Aromia. Around 20% of households report that they're able to meet food needs for less than seven days with available resources, suggesting a non-trivial level of food insecurity. We also observe that nearly all households, 90% in our sample, exhibit food insecurity, with 30% exhibiting severe food insecurity. And again, these patterns are very different across regions, with severe food insecurity in particular concentrated in Aromia. Thank you very much. I'll pass it back to you, Lucy. Thank you, Jessica. The final presenter is Harold Alderman, who will be sharing results on access to assistance and on experience of desert locusts. Over to you, Harold. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. One of the generalizations can be made globally about 
um, emergency response to a sudden onset emergency is it's most effective when there is already a safety net already in place, such as the program in Ethiopia. Slide, please. And what we see here is that the most people in the SPARE project received either cash or food, uh, and this was front-loaded. This They received their double rations at the beginning. Nevertheless, there is a regional difference in that in Amhara, most people still were expected to do the work requirement, the public works, while that was less in 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 Ormia. Ormia did have a, an increase uh, in, in free food and in, in cash transfers. Next slide, please. And this was entirely or virtually entirely due to the, the PSNP program. Uh, there were some um, other services provided by NGOs, but very, very, very little uh, that were not already part of the PSNP. The program was in place and it was able to respond very quickly. Next slide. There's very little difference, almost none, uh, between the relatively, and these are all people who are on the safety net, so this is all relative, the relatively poor uh, and the and the less poor, they're, they receive the same program, they receive the same assistance. There was no um, targeting within the uh, program. But as you've seen, there is a difference in the food security as reported by the, uh, um, households, but there's no difference in the program received. Next slide, please. So the program was able to respond to the initial part of the of the uh, of the crisis. Um, and in general, it was in Amhara business as usual. It looked a bit like business as usual, it's not business as usual because it was front loaded but there was still public works. Armia had a greater share of, uh, of cash. Next slide. Shifting over to the problem of desert locusts, what we have is a overlap of, of crises. We have the COVID crisis and we have the locust crisis. And in some places they, they um, are concurrent. Everybody knows about uh, uh, desert locusts. Uh, most households are reporting that they have direct experience. In fact, the next slide. Um, next slide, please. Um, there is actually 20% of the RMEA population reported that they had some crop damage at the end of the year, in the end of uh, 2019 by the uh, common calendar, not the Ethiopian calendar. And 30% in Armia said that they had pasture damage in 2020. 10% of the of the households in Amhara reported to that type of damage. So it's it, it is uh, overlapping with Armia, which we saw is also the area where there is just in general greater food insecurity. It's not possible to separate out how much of the food insecurity. Um, is due to uh, the COVID restrictions and how much is due to, to um, the locust. But those who said they had crop loss, which is a relatively small percent, as I told you, uh, uh, those who, who said they have um, crop loss are clearly have a higher chance of having uh, severe food security insecurity. So that overlap is, is apparent um, even in the first round of the locust. Uh, go on, please. Everybody is worried about the second round, the next round, which is, we said, in the next three months from our survey, which was, was done in June, so it, it's already uh, what should be happening or may be happening now. Almost the entire population, whether or not they are in Aramea, which has had some problems, or in Amhara, which has not yet had any problem and is not expected to have the same level of problem. 
and this does not differ. The next slide. Uh, this does not differ by income group. Everybody, whether they have assets or not, are worried about what's going to happen with the locust. So what we're having is an overlap. To summarize, we're having an overlap of food insecurity problems and stress due to the COVID and food insecurity and stress due to the locust. Where those two overlap is, is, is a um, uh, particular issue. And as I mentioned, Oromia has had already some crop damage and already some grazing land uh, 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 damage. And that was prior to, to June. So this is a, a, a problem that, that goes throughout uh, the, the region. Okay, I'd like to then turn it up back to the uh, moderators to discuss, to, to answer and to respond to any questions that, that uh, the audience has. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. Um, we now have about 20, 25 minutes for Q&A. So I would like to invite all of the presenters to turn your cameras back on. Um, we've received several questions and comments from participants and please feel free to submit additional questions. Um, all right, it looks like we have everybody back on. Um, so the first question is one that um, I'd like to invite Dan to respond to, asking about um, the reliability of um, phone surveys as, um, as a tool for collecting data and also whether this is recommended for collecting qualitative evidence. Sure, thanks, Lucy, and I appreciate the question. Um, we, I didn't get too much into kind of uh, the difference between this phone survey and our in-person surveys that we've been conducting uh, during the evaluation. So, um, but, so I appreciate the question. Um, phone surveys are certainly different, uh, so we have to be careful about sort of uh, how we sort of initiate the conversation um, and also the types of questions that we can ask effectively are also different and generally shorter and simpler. So um, we were helped here by the fact that we'd already visited these households at least twice um, for in-person interviews. And so the, the male respondents that we were trying to reach for the phone survey were people that had already been interviewed um, by the same survey firm and asked similar questions. Um, so uh, you know, by way of kind of introduction of the phone call, um, that's not as problematic. Um, we have to consent the interview as we always do. Um, and so that consent, of course, is done by phone. Um, but again, we had almost no refusals of consent. Um, but we think it was helped by the fact that we, we had already reached these households before. Um, the type of questions that we can ask are different. And um, we have experience actually from some other phone surveys too, where we have some relatively more complicated questions about kind of ladders of well-being um, that, that took a very long time to enumerate and didn't go that well. So, um, you know, we made sure that we were asking questions here that were a little bit more straightforward. In general, the types of questions we asked about well-being are on kind of, you know, increase or decrease rather than asking for quantities. Or sometimes we ask questions where we give kind of like a five-point scale. Uh, in general, we feel that that has gone pretty well and gives us a good sense of kind of the qualitative a qualitative sense of what's happened. Um, but getting sort of quantities of changes in consumption, I think that, that would be much harder. Um, overall, we felt it was a successful survey. Um, certainly the fact that we could reach almost 90% of the target um, respondents uh, was remarkable and a credit to our to Laterite, our survey partners. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. The next question is for Melissa. Um, and the the Participant is wondering um, if you have any speculation on why you think the um, perceived level of risk was low among uh, risk of um, becoming infected by coronavirus was low among the survey respondents. Sorry, um, let me just see. Okay, sorry, I was making sure I wasn't muted. Um, so I think the perceived level of risk was low among survey respondents for for two reasons. Um, respondents were 
taking protective measures. Um, and and in that sense, although they were it's so they were taking protective measures, and they definitely for those who have the low levels of perceived risk, they state that the reason they think that they have low levels of perceived risk is because they're taking protective measures. Now it's a little roundabout because all res there's um, all respondents were sort of taking protective measures, right? Um, it was an overwhelming majority of respondents were taking um, protect uh, were taking protective measures. So, but we ask why for those who are low levels uh, for low risk, why they perceived them to be low risk. And a lot of them said because they were taking protective measures. Um, so it is a certain type of respondent who is reporting taking protective measures and believes that because he is reporting taking protective measures, he has a low level of risk. Um, but when we probe a little bit about why, the most is because the most of respondents say because of their taking protective measures. And another reason that comes out is because they think um, it was it is God's will. Those were the two when we asked for those respondents who replied low levels of perceived risk. Thanks, Melissa. Now a question for Jessica. Um, are you able to share the average amount of loss of income that was? Go ahead. Sure, that's a great question. So getting back to Dan's comment about the pros and cons of phone surveys, we didn't attempt to pose specific questions about monetary amounts of loss of income. That would be quite difficult to elucidate over the phone in the absence of any ability to interact in person with a respondent. Instead, we simply asked them if they had lost income, experienced a total loss of income, meaning no income remains, gained or uh, their income is steady. So in the pie chart I showed at the beginning of my presentation, we saw that about 80% of households reported a loss in income, a very small number, about 1% reported a total loss, with the others reporting consistent or increased income. But unfortunately, we can't state how much income those uh, households might have lost. Thanks, Jessica. And another couple of questions for you. Um, <clears throat> one um, one participant is asking whether you can compare um, the change in food insecurity to the period just before the pandemic. And another question um, asking for some comparison with our baseline or midline data. Sure, those are good questions. And unfortunately, in both cases, we don't have adequate data. So we certainly do not have food security information from immediately prior to the pandemic because we weren't conducting a survey at the time. When we posed the questions about food insecurity, we prompted respondents to refer to the period since our reference date in late February. So it should reflect their early pandemic experience, but we did not go on to also pose questions about the prior period, assuming that would be both time consuming and potentially a bit repetitious. In terms of our baseline and midline data, we didn't use similar food insecurity scales. We do have some information about food insecurity that we could potentially explore, but I think there are some concerns about comparability, both because the questions are different and because the survey mortality is so different comparing an in-person and a phone survey. But it's certainly something that we can attempt to explore more in future. Thank you, Jessica. And, um, this is this is a more open question. So um, if if there are any of the presenters who would like to respond to this, um, <clears throat> one one of the participants who is a member of the implementation team noted that there's re regional variation in terms of stress levels. Um, nearly 90% um, reported high stress in Armia compared to 40% in Amahara, and um, wondering if there's a reason um, that we can that we can ascertain from the survey data as to why there is such a stark regional difference. I can start on the response. Part of it has to do with, the, as I said, the overlapping shocks. Um, part of it has to do with the fact that Army is already uh, less food secure. 
and then there is the issue also that there's unrest in the army. All of those things are just a, a combination and it's, it's not possible to separate out the stress caused by one compared to the stress caused by the other. In every case, the household who is at a very low level of food security is going to be stressed, um, whether it comes from one source or another. So I think that the reason why our army is so stressed has to do with both environmental conditions and, and, and some uh, social conditions as well. Thank you, Harold. And now cycling back to Melissa, um, a question about whether um, there's any data available on whether low uptake of masks and hand sanitizer is linked at all to the availability of um, these protective measures. Do you have a sense of whether um, it's acceptable, considered acceptable to use a mask? So unfortunately, we did not ask follow-up questions on why um, sort of use of mask or hand sanitizer were less commonly reported protective measures. Um, acceptability might be one, uh, whether or not there was a ready, a ready supply, whether or not it was um, you would have to buy them or if they were given for free would probably also affect their ability to use them in the last seven days. And so unfortunately, we did not collect any information on this in the phone survey, um, so so we don't really know. But the two that were the two protective measures that were the less frequently reported were those two where you actually might have to availability or purchasing um, might be an issue. Thanks, Melissa. And another question for Dan on the survey design. Um, the participant is wondering whether there was any gender analysis um, <clears throat> and uh, whether the tool was designed to, um, to be able to do any gender analysis, and if not, suggesting that this would be something that could be done in a follow-up survey. Uh, sure, that's really welcome. We, um, as I mentioned, so, in the in the midline survey questionnaire, we had um, interviews separately for both male and female respondents. So essentially, our primary female respondent in these surveys is the mother of a, a child, a young child from the baseline, um, and then the the partner of that woman is the typically the primary male respondent. So there's quite a bit of gender analysis that we've done um, out of the past survey rounds. Here we were much more limited because we had to keep the phone survey short. We didn't think it was going to be very effective to try to separately interview both men and women in the same phone survey. Um, and because of the focus of this, the topics for this round, we decided together that um, selecting male respondents for this round was, was our best approach. So we don't have a lot here in this phone survey round that we could use to do uh, sort of a disaggregated gender analysis. Um, but it's a focus for us going forward, and we do have another survey round planned um, just in a couple of weeks, um, and we'll consider whether we continue to do this later on in the year. And so um, that's something that we can that we're we're discussing whether we can bring that back in. Thanks. And uh, follow up to that, Dan. This is um, from another another participant. Um, to clarify, were households interviewed at all if there was no male respondent? available? That's a good question. Um, we, in, so we reached nearly 1,200 households in, I think in all of those cases, it was the male respondent. So I guess for the remaining kind of 10% that we couldn't reach, I don't know, although we have records on this, but I, I can't, can't recall at the moment and it was a, the issue is that we reached the household, but, but the male respondent was not available. I, I think in the vast majority of those cases, we simply could not reach the household at all. Also, in most cases, the household number, the number that we had for the household was the household, uh, was the number of a male respondent. So in general, sort of reaching the men was not too much of a problem, but I can't say whether um, in some cases we reached the household, but the, the male respondent wasn't available. Okay, thanks very much. Um, 
Let's see, we have another question for Melissa, um, whether you have a sense of what households mean when they say that they were impacted by travel restrictions. In particular, um, was, was this related to an inability to bring their products to market? So the way we asked it, we didn't actually specify anything about inability to bring to markets. We really just said, um, we listed nine different aspects and we generally said travel restrictions. Um, and so what, what we do know though is that there were also food shortages. Again, we didn't specifically ask about markets. Um, we sort of distinctly asked just about travel restrictions and then just about food shortages. So we don't right now know, we can't tease out how much that does relate to markets or not. We are hoping that in the next survey round, we can find a little more about what was going on in markets. Um, but unfortunately, the way that the first two questions were, were phrased, we, we didn't specifically ask about access to markets. Thank you, Melissa. And I'll direct this next question to Harold, although um, he didn't present on this, but he has been looking at these data. Um, whether you observe difference in consumption of dairy products and eggs across the two regions. Uh, I, I don't know. We did, as you saw, we did have a breakdown of decline. Um, we didn't ask quantities. Um, so, um, impossible we it is possible we can say whether the declines uh were greater in a in a uh, region uh, one of the other regions but we cannot I, I don't know the results we can't get the quantities the quantities by the way are relatively low from our midline diet diversity is relatively low with um fortunately the poultry project our midline shows uh, does increase uh, egg consumption, but we don't have quantities in this survey. And as I said, I haven't seen the the uh, regional breakdown. It'd be something that we can probably easily generate. Thanks, Harold. Um, I now have another question for Jessica, um, and I think that this might relate back to the earlier discussion on um, stress as well in terms of regional differences, but this participant is um, asking why the, why you think we might be seeing such a um, difference in the experience of food shortage between the two regions. Sure, that's obviously a very substantial question. As was alluded to earlier, even prior to the pandemic, in general, baseline food insecurity was higher in Aromia using most available data. It's also the case, as Harold presented, that the desert locust shock has been more acute there. So the dual shock of both the pandemic and the desert locusts would presumably produce a more intense response. Beyond that, I think Melissa's point about understanding more about markets is very important. We haven't been able to do much yet, but based on all the available data suggesting that restrictions and shutdowns and normal activities were more intense in Oumia, then it would be plausible for that to be associated with more breakdowns in access to food if households can't reach markets uh, and pursue normal uh, commercial activities. And all the data we have suggests that that is more likely to be true in Oromia, though you know, assessing precisely the severity in the different regions is still very challenging. Thanks, Jessica. And another question um, that perhaps you can respond to um, or another member of the panel. Um, did, did you notice any um, borrowing as a coping mechanism from the survey respondents? That's a good question. We did include that as an option, I believe, but it was not commonly cited. So I, I can't say that it was non-existent, but it was certainly not one of the most five coping mechanisms. And as I recollect, seemed quite rare. Uh, by contrast, drawing on savings and selling assets were very common. The 
one plausible reason might be based on our pre previous data in the midline underlying access to credit particularly this type of emergency credit for consumption is not high in this population so it's reasonable to expect that for most of these households drawing on credit would be an option that's very challenging if not impossible to access Thanks, Jessica, and thanks to all the panelists. Um, we've completed the questions that have been submitted in the question box. box. There are a number of comments also, particularly from the um, implementation team who's joining today. So I think that the, um, the researchers will be really interested to see these comments and exchange further on um, these observations. Um, I'd just like to do a last round if any of the presenters have um, any final comments in response to the questions. Um, so Dan, I'll start with you. I don't, I have a few closing remarks, Lucy, which I'll come back to, but um, okay. it was a great set of questions and people were covering well. It's, it's clear that they were sort of seeing what we were doing and had some really good ideas maybe for things we need to consider in the next round. So appreciate the questions. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. We'll come back to you. And Melissa, any final response to any of the questions? No, I, I do not. Thank you. Thank you okay. for the questions. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Jessica, any final responses? No, thanks to everyone for their questions and comments. Okay, and over to Harold. My only comment is stay tuned. We're going back, the uh, phone survey, going back uh, very shortly. And given that there's a cumulated impact um, and because we also have learned something and how to uh, delve further into the markets and what has affected uh, access and, and employment, uh, the next uh, uh, webinar on this uh, will address some of the questions raised. Thanks, Harold. And Michael, there weren't any questions directed to you, but um, do you have any, any insights or responses to the questions that have been discussed this morning? No, I, I'm perhaps just to add that uh, one of the things that did come out both in the presentation and in the discussion was this uh, story around uh, the challenges that are seem seemingly heightened in, in Oromia as compared to Amhara. And that's also um, uh, corroborated with what we're also seeing from our own staff. And then, as many will know, there, the recent events in, in uh, Ethiopia were particularly uh, experienced um, much worse in, in Oromia with the death of uh, this um, popular singer and activist. So yeah, as we go back and as we um, in kind of anticipate what we may find in coming rounds, we also, um, the desert locust issue is also projected to be much worse in Oromia than our areas in Amhara. So again, we're, we've already seen this kind of stark regional difference and we might expect this to trend to continue and yeah, is of concern for us as implementers, as um, uh, people that are uh, seeking to respond to the, the needs on the ground. So we'll continue to use this information as we uh, design and adapt our programs to the context we're working in, uh, together, of course, with uh, great support from USAID uh, throughout. So over to you, Dan. Great. Thanks, Michael. Um, thanks, everyone. I, yeah, I just have a few closing remarks and kind of want to overview provide a little bit of an overview of, I think, what we've learned in this first round two. It's clear the COVID-19 pandemic has had really substantial effects on the well-being of the PSNP beneficiaries in Ethiopia. Um, they're reporting to us widespread use of protective measures, which is welcome to see, uh, but they also have considerable fear of becoming infected. Um, I was surprised at the, the, the rate of people saying that they were highly concerned about their personal uh, they're highly fearful of their personal uh, risk of becoming infected. Uh, the vast majority of respondents reported income losses um, and food shortages as well. Generally, most of these problems were substantially worse in Ormia, certainly with regard to food security, than in Amhara. Um, as we've discussed here, that's a, that the reasons for that are many. So certainly past trends play a role, um, but the economic effects of the pandemic there were seasonal rainfall shocks, um, pest shocks. Besides the, the desert locust, there's also fall armyworm as a problem. Um, and, and those problems all contribute to this difference in regional distribution of food insecurity um, and some of the other outcomes that we've seen. Um, the social unrest is also worse in Ormia. So all of these factors are playing a role. 
Um, and part of what we've done is just essentially to document the, the severity of them in, in the two regions, um, but also the resulting stress. So the, as you saw, the reported stress levels across the, the sample are high, but they're just alarmingly high in Ormia. Eight, more than 85% of respondents said that their stress level is a 10 out of 10. Um, so this is uh, among a lot of other potential responses that mental health services uh, could really play a role here. Um, the SPEAR project has been piloting a mental health intervention before the pandemic hit. Um, and that's something that we're continuing to study and that um, we hope we'll be able to kind of do um, as, as, as we ramp up again and, and hopefully we're able to go back and do in-person surveys. So we expect to actually from this study to be able to learn more about the, the benefits of mental health uh, in general for the households, but also uh, in the context. And as Michael mentioned, um, we're working very closely with SPEAR on this. They're, you're, they're using the information uh, this phone survey has helped inform um, their response to the crisis. And uh, we're learning from what they're seeing on the ground, of what you know, we want to bring to the next phone survey. So as I mentioned, we have another survey going into the into the field, I say, going, going to the phones. And uh, just kind of time and looking forward to learning more, uh, we definitely have some folks there on, on access to markets and uh, continued questions about uh, agriculture and livelihoods, but hope to be able to bring in some aspects of gender uh, as well. Okay, so thanks everyone for participation and, and your interest and great questions. Lucy, I'll give it over to you for the last word. Thanks very much, Dan, and thanks to all the presenters. Um, thanks to the participants and your great questions. If you do have any um, questions after the session or comments that you would like to share with the research team, please feel free to send them to me at um, l.billings at cgiar.org. Um, and with that, we will close the webinar. Thanks to all. <laughs>